If you'd like to talk about your own Bigfoot encounter, or if you're looking for help from a Bigfoot investigator in your area, email me at bigfootcrossroads at gmail.com. No Sasquatch were harmed in the recording of this podcast. Hello, this is Lance Hightower with Monster 911. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be on your show. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've been meaning to hook up with you for years. Uh, then we kind of did a dance back and forth for a while, but the stars have we finally did. aligned. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's uh, it, it's just one of those things because uh, you're out of Tulsa as well, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, this is awesome. I, I've been waiting for a long time as well to uh, kind of get together with you. It's really strange. I heard about you before I knew who you were. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Um, you actually know a couple of friends of mine, Dan and Vicky. That's oh, I from years and years ago. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, I cut my teeth in the Bigfoot world with those two. Yeah, I talked to Dan. Oh my goodness, you're bringing back memories. Um, I talked to Dan when I used to work, uh, it was at 3M uh, years ago in Weatherford, Oklahoma. Yeah. And uh, Dan and I ran into each other. I can't even recall where now. Oh, wait a minute. I think it was in a small little town. You might have to help me here. I think Bear was there doing a presentation, and that's where I met Dan. Uh, at Glenn McDonald's bookstore? Yes, yes, okay. thank you. Yeah. Yes, I saw Dan there, and we started chatting, and we knew people together, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, and I remembered him. It's a small world when you get inside Oklahoma. It really is. It really is. I had forgot about that. So, you know, like, when was the first time you ever heard about Bigfoot? Like, what got you down oh. this path of all things to follow? Well, like, yeah, great question. Um like many people in this community, it, it was uh, either a desire, an obsession, you know, never having, you know, those that's never really had an encounter. But it started very small with me. I think I was like eight years old or somewhere in that range, eight to nine. And uh, I saw some books at an old grocery store in Braggs, Oklahoma. We lived in the Sand Hills in um, – it's outside of um, – they have a military base there right now, but it's near Tin Killer, that area yeah. outside of Muskogee. So anyway, I picked up a book um, and it talked about Bigfoot. And I thought it, I thought it was immediately fascinating because it had um, the name Monster on it. So I begged my dad um, to take me, you know, for I don't know how many months when The Legend of Boggy Creek came out. And, uh, of course, he did after me harassing him for I don't know how long. And then when he did, of course, I had nightmares for uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> And, uh, you know, what's ironic about that is that uh, I became deathly afraid of the dark at that time. But I had an incident happen when I was 10 years old out at our house. Again, we lived about five miles outside of Bragg's. And when I say in the sand hills, literally the roads are sand. I mean, just like powdered sand. And uh, there was an incident. I was in the garden, and it was actually about this time of the day. The sun was setting, and it was just one of those moments where you're used to whippoorwills. I, I always uh, love to hear the whippoorwills in the evening, and that was a common thing in the summer. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden, everything kind of went silent, and it, it went so silent that I stopped. And I'm like, what's going on? And I was near the wood line where the garden meets the edge of the timber. And so I, it was just an odd feeling. And so I started looking around like, what's going on? And there was nobody with me, of course. I knew I was by myself. But something told me just to squat down and look in the foliage or under the tree line. And I, I, I looked deeper and I could see this silhouette of this, this figure. And I could make the outline that it was, there was an upright figure in the trees. It was very dark, but it was enough that I could see the silhouette. I could see the, uh, the space between the arms and the body. 
and I could just, uh, I couldn't make out any identifiable features and there was no swaying, there was no sound, there was no smell, but it was just that feeling like I, I got to get out of here. It's not, something's not right. So I back, I backed my way out slowly, still keeping my eye. I was backing out of the, the rows of what I was, my dad wanted me to put some hay on the strawberries and I backed out about maybe 60 yards. And then I, my bike, I got on my bike and I pedaled as fast as I could. And then went to the house and I got inside and I just stayed there. Uh, a couple nights later, uh, my brother, we had a, we shared a bunk bed and uh, one of my brothers and I slept on the top bunk. And, you know, back in the seventies, you know, we didn't, we didn't have a lot of money or anything. And so my mom, when she would hang curtains, she was very short. So there was still a huge space or a gap at the top of the window that didn't have any curtain on it. And, so you could easily from my bed look out the window and there was no obstruction of even curtain and, and the curtains were sheer anyway. And I was laying there. It was late at night. I could tell everybody was asleep and I just kind of woke up and I, I woke from hearing this deep guttural growl and I could tell it was literally outside the window. It wasn't low. It was high, but I was not, I was not going to turn and look. Uh, and again, I was about 10 years old. I knew if I looked, I would see something that it would be imprinted in my brain. I didn't want it there. So I, I froze I, with fear. I couldn't even move. Literally, I was, I was shaking so bad in the bed that my brother from the bottom bunk got up and trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Wow. And I couldn't move. And he, he was, he said, Lance, 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 are you okay? I said, Yes, pull me down, pull me down. I wasn't going to move, and so he pulled me down. I fell on the floor. Um, I tried to tell my parents, and of course, as many parents have you heard, you know, stories, oh, just go back to bed, it's nothing. Well, I knew it was something. Um, I told my dad the next day, you know, and he just said, oh, it's one of those bears around, which, you know, we, we had black bears, but this just, it was, to me, as a kid, it almost was too coincidental for, to see something a few days in the garden that's not there. And I even went back in the garden to see if it was a stump or a tree that silhouetted something to make it look like something. And there, it was gone. So um, I got in the same place and it was I could tell it was absent. So that was kind of my experience as a kid. Um, and then growing up deer hunting and trapping and being out in the woods all my life. Uh, we just had a collection of oddities. We never connected any dots. Um, and then when my brother Lane had an incident back in 1993 with a buddy that, uh, it took Lane about two years to tell me what had happened because he, he still didn't know really at that time, you know, it, and it's like anyone, they have this, you, you, when you see something clearly and there's no obstruction and it's either chasing you or standing there, you have this cognitive dissident. You, you, you just can't, you're not paralleling what you're seeing because it's nothing like you've seen before. Mm -hmm. It's not even supposed to be there. And that's kind of what happened with Lane. Um, this Bigfoot uh, came up from behind the truck, stood there and started swaying back and forth. Um uh, which was our first show that we had was interviewing my brother Lane on what happened. And uh, it, 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 a series of things happened and then it ended up chasing them and grabbing after trying to grab after the truck. Wow. Uh, it, it, it put the, his buddy in shock. I mean, literally Lane had to grab the wheel and say, Hey, you're going to kill us. Stop the car. Um, and the guy didn't want to go back. Lane said, Hey, let's go back. What, what, what was that? What was that? Um, so they never went back. Uh, all their gear, all their stuff fell out of the back of the truck, their cooler, their rods, reels, everything that they were going to fish that evening. So after he told me that he'd waited a couple years to tell me, I asked him why. And he says, well, I didn't think you'd believe me. And, and I trust me, I didn't even think I believed myself. And then after a couple of, we started talking a lot about things that happened at deer camp. We started just saying, well, what if? And so, uh, Lane said, uh, you know, uh, this YouTube thing, have you been on it yet? And I said, well, I've been on it a couple of times. He said, you have to listen to some shows. I think you'll find it interesting. So we started doing that. And then we, I thought, you know, why don't we 
free to show that we can use this therapy for ourselves and see if anybody else is interested. And so that's kind of what we, that's how we started in um, January, 2017. Uh, but that's kind of what led us on this path, if you will. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah. That's just, my, my mind's racing here for a second. How long did that fear hold on to you from whenever you were a child? Oh man. Um, from the time I was about 10 till I was about 17. Um, it's not for everybody what I'm getting ready to say, but this was how I got over my fear. My dad, uh, I love my dad, but my dad was horrible at scaring the daylights out of me. Um, he would, uh, you know, because I imagine he, this was done to him, but he would turn out the lights outside and he would say, hey, go get me uh, my uh, red man chewing tobacco. <laughs> and then I would go outside and he would lock, the, turn off the lights. And what is very, very ironic here is he would shut the door and say, Bigfoot's going to get you. Wow. And I didn't know what Bigfoot looked like. I saw that silhouette, but all I knew is that whatever that was, I didn't want it after me. And right. so I was pounding on the door. And finally, one time when I was 17, I thought, you know, I got to get over this. So we lived in state parks all my life. My dad was a superintendent then became a manager. So we, we would hop uh, state park to state park. I think we went to three and then he retired at the third one in Western Oklahoma. And that was called Romano state park near outside of Watonga. And that's, that's where we went to school. And while I was in the park, I worked in the park in the summers, every summer I had a job there. And, uh, and finally one time I just said, you know what, I'm going to get over my fear. So I went running at night through those canyons and on the Mesa top Hills Wow! without a flashlight, which is extremely dangerous. I do not recommend that. That was kind of dumb. Uh, but I thought if I'm going to get over it, I need to get over it now. So I just went out. I just put my hands up and across when I was going through the canyons, running through, it was pitch black and I could feel that I was going up an incline, which means I was coming out of it, out of the bottom. And then I would, uh, I try to pick a full moon night and I would do that all through the summer. And that's how I got over my fear. I mean, uh, I certainly wouldn't suggest anyone trying that. <laughs> no, absolutely. No, no. Uh, well, I'll just say the, the caveat what stopped me ultimately doing that, because that's really dumb to do, uh, was that I ran into an old rusty barbed wire fence uh, one night, and uh, it just about caught my eye. And I came home, and uh, I had taken my shirt off, and uh, I would placed it, it. It caught just above my eye, and I was bleeding. I could feel warm on my face and I knew I was bleeding. So I took my shirt off, ripped it, tied it around to stop the bleeding. And I, I, you know, I, I walked a couple miles back to the house. It was at night. I had no flashlights. So I was just walking through the woods. And then, uh, that wasn't the half of it. Cause I knew if I woke my dad up, you know, you never wake a dad up no matter what it is, because <laughs> you know, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you know, you're going to get it. So I knew that. So I saw my mom and uh, she looked at me. She goes, Lance, what's going on? I said, shh, it's okay. Let's just go to the hospital. I need <laughs> stitches. And so, of course, my dad goes, what, what, what? And then he was mad at me. But that's when I kind of stopped it. He got mad at me. But uh, I got over my fear. I do not recommend it to anyone. But uh, it took me a long time. Uh, it really did. But after that, um, you know, it seemed like it just, uh, it just dissipated. Uh, I have a healthy respect for what navigates in the woods now, but, uh, I, I don't fear the dark like I did at one time. That part of the country is dangerous Bigfoot country. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because at that time, like many of, of your guests and, and some of mine, um, we have this preconceived notion where we think Bigfoot are at and where we think they're not, but I uh, cannot disagree. You are absolutely 100% correct. Uh, what's interesting about where we lived 
in Romano's State Park is that we were always privileged to live in the park. And where our house is at is on a hill that sit uh, just above the pool area. And it's a very pretty park. The whole, the whole state park resides in this massive canyon in which the Native Americans in that area, uh, who knows how long they encamped in there, uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. And so there was some uh, areas that were uh, very, very uh, sacred areas of uh, important medicine. And so my dad showed me these areas, and so I tended to stay away from those areas just out of respect. I didn't know much about it, but just I knew enough to stay out because of respect. And But what's interesting is that both Bill, my brother Bill, and Lane had a silhouette encounter at their window while they were both. They shared a room, and I have another brother that we shared a room. Well, Bill and Lane were going to sleep one night and their beds faced this large picture window uh, with this very sheer curtain and the moon was out and uh, they were just laying there. It was late at night. My parents were in bed kind of drifting off and they were there whispering, talking. And uh, as Bill and Lane uh, at the same time, they were whispering, they looked and there was three silhouette shadows that the moon was so bright that night that it was casting the silhouette into the window and it was a large and a medium and a smaller silhouette and the large silhouette you could tell it was they were so close to the window as they were passing by you could see the outline of the hair from the four from the forehead all the way around the top of the cranium all the way down the back down to the shoulders and even say mid back and you could see it also in the chest area. Um, the the one out front was leading. That was the large one. You could just see the jawline. The medium one, you could see the entire silhouette in which you could see this uh, cone-type head, that the cranium. It was cone-like. And then you could see the smaller one. You could just see somewhere like, uh, uh, is what uh, Bill and Lane said, somewhere around uh, – eye level and you could see the but it was a it was a slow walk close to their window and it was going north and they were looking at each other like what the heck so initially you want to say these are some people playing around but if it was you know if you take the logic in this if it was someone messing around Usually as humans, you want to grab the attention of someone. Right. You want to t- tap on a window, yell, throw a rock, uh, whatever to, you know, create some noise. But there was nothing. It was just these three silhouettes at a nice, even walk, a slow walk, walk by the window and heading north. Uh, Bill got up and he went to the window on the north side. And he said he was looking at Lane and Lane says, do it, do it, do it. And he wanted to look outside, but he said, I couldn't do it, Lance. I couldn't do it. I was afraid that if I opened it up, it'd be staring at me right there. So he never looked to see truly what it was. But uh, I, there were some other things that happened in the park that was just over the years. Uh, campers, people that were in cabins, were missing items um, out of their truck, uh, doors were left open at night. Now I can't say a hundred percent that that was a Bigfoot, but it was just strange events like that where doors were open and there was nothing taken. Um, it, it was just little oddities over the years that didn't add up, but we didn't know anything about Bigfoot in that area whatsoever. Right. Um, I've actually heard a story from the park myself, uh, a guy related it to me years ago. Um, it was of course, you know, a second hand. I heard it from so-and-so. Um, Mm -hmm. but it was about a guy who was staying there in a camper, I believe. And he had his dog with him. Uh, I believe the dog was a German shepherd. Not that that's really relevant or anything, but, uh, something, uh, was walking around the camper at night. The dog started growling. Um, the guy got up and opened, uh, the door to the camper and the dog refused to go out 
and kind of whimpered and backed away from the door a little bit. And the guy closed mm. the camper door back and locked it. And I think he went back to bed or something and woke up to something rocking the camper from the outside. And, oh. and, and the dog was just all cowered up and wasn't barking or growling or anything, just staying quiet. And, uh, and this was there at the park. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, I'm not sure uh, what year it would have been or anything like that. Like I said, it was all secondhand, but, uh, it was at Roman nose. Well, that the campground, it's really interesting. Like I said, it's like the, the whole park is in this whole is in this Canyon. So if you're on the top ground, it looks like just a flat Mesa top, but and then it just kind of opens up. And what's interesting about that park is that there is uh, natural springs all through the park, and the the water is cold year round at fifty five degrees, and it's 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 really clear. It has a lot of gypsum in there, so that area has such a high concentration of gypsum. It's one of the largest concentrations at any place in the United States, which is kind of interesting. But they uh, there's plenty of wildlife. There's lots of deer and turkey and small game in that area. Uh, plenty of cover, plenty of water. And that back end where that campground is, that's interesting because it kind of opens up. It, it, the back of the canyon just opens up, and you can see in the distance, uh, I think it's uh, the little, little town called Omega, Oklahoma. Yeah. So it, it just, you can get lost in those canyons, you know, when you're above, it looks like it's just wide open, but when you get down in those canyons, it's really, really thick with sage, tamaracks, uh, blackjack, it's thick. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, we were talking about Dan and Vicky and at, they used to live out there, um, in a little town called Alfalfa. Oh, okay. And, uh, you know, their main research area was just you know, a, a stone's throw from where they lived. And I remember mm. the first time I visited them, uh, coming from up here in Northeastern Oklahoma, <laughs> you know, I got out there and I was right. like, there's no way it's all just mm. flat land out here. And then they took me to the canyons. They took me to purgatory, you know, places like that. And mm. I mean, it's crazy. It, it's thick in those canyons. And the Bigfoot down there just run those canyons and the creeks all the time. Yeah, I mean, it, it really was an eye opener when um, Wiley would take me coyote hunting out there in Cimarron and Beaver County and those uh, those quote unquote flat areas of Oklahoma. And he would tell me some encounter stories. And he would show me some of these areas. He said, it looks flat at her, doesn't it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, no, it's not. He goes, there's some ravines out here you could hide semi-trucks in. Mm -hmm. And he showed me a couple of them out there. And he goes, "There's a, he goes, uh, you know, there's a lot of people out here. When the sun goes down, There's car, you won't see a car out on these county roads. And I said, uh, really? And I said, what's up? And he goes, well, they know what's up. They don't want to come out here because there's things out here that start, they're roaming around these open plains. I said, you're kidding. He says, no, I'm not kidding. He said, a lot of people will run into Bigfoot out here um, running down or walking down these county roads. And so you won't pass anybody for miles and miles and miles. And, of course, out there where he was at, he had that episode with that uh, dogman creature in 2003. So... It's an interesting area just where these creatures, these beings are at. It's it's not where you would think in most cases. Not at all. Um, I remember one of the most impressive things was looking out at an area that we are headed to. And you could see, you know, basically from the highway, it just kind of looked like an open field, slight rises here and there, but you could see what looked like uh, shrubs or like a thicket out there. And mm. by the time we turned off the highway and took the road and got to it and drove down into it, you saw that those were treetops just sticking above, you know, yes. the, the eye line of the, of the field that you're looking across. And they're actually, you know, 20 and 30 foot tall trees down in this canyon. And uh, that yes. really blew my mind. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is quite eye-opening. Uh, you know, way back, 
uh, you're sparking some memories here that I haven't thought of in a while. Um, one of the, uh, this was prior to 2017 before we got started, but this was probably, oh man, maybe uh, 15, 20 years ago. I remember listening to George Norrie and he was talking, there was a gentleman that called in at that time and he was out there in the panhandle of Texas, uh, very close to the border of uh, Oklahoma. And uh, he was describing, uh, I still remember uh, his nickname, I guess you called, what they called him was Bugs. And he had a story that he had to relay to George about what had occurred out there, that they were him and some buddies that uh, were Vietnam vets, and they would go hog hunting, spotlighting at night. And uh, they were on their own property or on uh, a buddy that was with them, their property, and they would do this at night and just kind of uh, have a good time. And they uh, basically, uh, long story short, they spotlighted to Bigfoot. And uh, long story short, they ended up uh, shooting both. One charged at them at the very end, and they uh, shot the female. Uh, it, it bothered him so much over the years, he finally had to just uh, tell George, someone, that uh, he said, here's a map, here's where I buried them, and I just want it off my conscience. I don't know what they are. They did not look, parts of them looked human, but the other parts did not. And But he was surprised that something like that would be out there because he, he was describing the landscape, which is exactly like, you know, out that way, uh, flat, undulating hills with canyons with, you know, the, the canyons have massive trees, 30, 40, 50, 60, even 70 feet in height. And there, but in a lot of those deep ravines and canyons, there's fresh water, there's, uh, uh enough wildlife that you can sustain, uh, a large being out there, uh, when you can travel miles in a given night or a given day. You know, you mentioned your sighting whenever, you know, the silhouette that you saw as a child. And yes. then years later, your brother has an encounter. And then mm -hmm. your brothers have an encounter over here in different parts of the country. Yes. That seems to be something happening. Uh, that once that curtain is pulled back on a person or a family, it's almost like they become some kind of Bigfoot magnet. Have I've noticed, noticed that. that. Yes, yes, yes. I had this conversation. That's that's incredible. Where you, you brought that up, Matt. Um, uh, I just had this night before last with the gentleman. Uh, he asked that same thing. He said, "What's your take on this, Lance?" He goes, "Because it seems like once a person." sees one of these creatures or you, you have a, I, I don't care if it's a vocalization that you cannot place or you have a sighting or an encounter or something. It's like, what is your take on that? And I said, well, oh, that's such a great question. I, I, I don't think I can answer it in one sitting only to say that this is going to sound really deep here, parts of it, uh, but I honestly, right off the bat, I'm going to say I don't have a handle on that, but I'll just give Lance's explanation. I think that there are th things that we don't quite understand as humans that when we focus on things, when we think about things, you tend to attract. I think that's just... I, I, I truly believe personally it's something that God put in us that you attract what you think about the most. Um, um, so that's one aspect. If you think about it a lot, you be careful what you think about. Uh, here's that brain, so my apologies. Oh, you're fine. Um, so I be careful what you focus on because you just might get it. So that's one part. I think another aspect is um, – the region a person happens to be in quite often, you know, uh, we were in state parks. We were in areas that uh, we had uh, a lot of the public come and visit, uh, camp and fish and hike and bike and all those things. But there was other times of the year that the park was dead and it was a great habitat for, because you cannot hunt in a state park. Uh, everything is protected, at least, you know, in Oklahoma. 
Uh, we had, uh, there was food my dad would place out for the wildlife to feed the deer, to feed the turkey. So there was an abundance of wildlife. And again, no one can hunt, so they were protected. So I think the region a person is either living in or tends to visit a lot has something to do. Those areas that are unattracted, if you will, that particular, whether it's the lay of the land, the topography, or the foliage or, or whatnot. Um, so I, I guess those are my, and I guess guess with those two combined, you tend to acknowledge or then start to understand there's more out there. The world is a bit mysterious than what you originally thought. So you tend to have this uh, enlightenment, this, this your, your radar is now on. You, you now hear things that you, where you couldn't put it together or you, if you will, didn't connect the dots. Now you're connecting the dots. Wait a minute. I've heard that sound before. I know that's not this. I know what it's not. So what else am I thinking? You know, could it be that? So I think you tend to, our mind as human beings always gravitates towards solutions and what ifs and it wants an answer. And I think with all those two combined, that third, you start connecting that there's more out there than really what you originally thought. So I always say, is it good to know there's more out there? Uh, is it good to know? Yes, absolutely. Rather than, you know, uh, not know. So uh, that, that's just my answers of, of this attracted affinity uh, that people after one encounter or sighting, they tend to have more. The region also plays a part into that. Uh, a lot of people say right place, right time. Sure. And you know, you can't rule out a little bit of luck every once in a while too, possibly. I, I don't know. I know, for instance, Wiley, uh, I'll put it this way. Every time I've been out with Wiley, we see something. Every time I go with my brother Lane, we see something. Uh, now, I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it, it's just that I, I wish I had a direct, great answer, but I, I haven't yet found what that is. I think it's important, though, even though we don't know the answer for certain, that we can acknowledge that, yeah, something's going on. That Absolutely. It does, that it does happen. Yes. Um, I think your answer, I think your theories are really strong ones, uh, for sure. Um, I, I grew up uh, going to the lake fishing all the time. And it was kind of like as I got older, the more fish I caught, the more I understood how they act, where I need to fish at, what I need to fish with, when I need to fish. And I think mm. the same sort of thing kind of applies to this. Um, your brain, even if you're not trying to, your brain's solving the problem. Uh, yes. And so you kind of end up putting yourself in the right places at the right times, um, even if it's not that intentional. Uh, another aspect of it is, like you were saying with the state parks, I, uh, preach that 100%. <laughs> My uh, <laughs> prime research area, whenever I was going out into the field was at the Chickasaw park here in Oklahoma and mm, okay. they had sightings. Uh, I knew people that lived in the town of sulfur and mm, okay. they were into Bigfoot as well. And the people of the town all worked at the park and, you know, with the police department and everything else. So they would hear about, you know, tourists seeing these things. So it was ongoing activity and this park during the tourist season just gets flooded with people. And wow. then whenever summer's over or spring breaks over, it's just dead, just completely empty. You have people on the weekends and stuff, but Throughout the week, it's completely empty. And over the years, I believe that these things have gotten more accustomed to being around people and raiding trash cans and, you know, getting closer than they normally would in a different environment because they were used to hiding from people and just not caring. You know, nothing happened mm -hmm. to me the last time I got seen. So I'm just going to go ahead and get in the trash can. And No, uh, I... I agree. I, and you know, you, you brought up another memory. I remember at the group camp, there was two group camps and there was a group camp two that was re resided just above the horse stables there at Romano's. And there was a lot of, um, 
we had tons of people coming church camps and Boy Scouts and different types of church organizations that would stay in tents and group camps and lots of trash, lots of trash. And I remember as a, as a kid, uh, my mom was the caretaker to the group camp and she would tell my dad, someone, uh, took all the garbage out of the garbage bin and it is, uh, they're, the garbage is strewed out all over the place and there's garbage going off into the woods. Uh, uh, you got to go send uh, someone to go pick all that stuff up. And I, I, my mom was kind of puzzled, like who would take garbage and strew it off into the woods. Um, and these were a bunch of garbage sacks, you know? So, you know, could that have been something else? It's possible. Sure. But it's just other things that she would report, uh, doors that the uh, screen doors would be off of the cabin doors, uh, like torn off the back end, which faced, which was against the wood line. So I I hadn't thought about that in years. That's interesting. So you guys uh, started a podcast. You said 2017. Mm -hmm. Um, You also started going out into the field, didn't you? Yes. Um, we were kind of going into the field before we really had this podcast. I mean, we'd go deer hunting and we would explore a lot. We would, uh, uh, we didn't really make a lot of annual trips as a, as a family, as, as brothers and my dad and some friends until around, uh, the early 2000 and teens. Uh, but we singularly would go out, you know, uh, a brother here and there, we would go together or go with my dad. We were doing that for years. Um, but where we would go when we started kind of getting together or more organized, uh, we would go down to Southeast Oklahoma, down in um, McCurtain County. And we would uh, go down there. We had some favorite spots. And uh, we found uh, one of our favorite spots was near a creek. And it was uh, not too. It was on the uh, WMA uh, Three Rivers Wildlife Management Area. So it's a it's a primitive encampment. So you basically you bring in whatever you're going to. There's no uh, there's no electric. So you got to generate your own electric. Uh, you bring in your own firewood. You can't cut firewood out there. Uh, you bring your own food in there. Literally, it's whatever you bring in. Uh, so we would go out there and we had a lot of interesting events happen that we would just scratch our head and say, what the heck was that? Uh, and so in 2000, you know, finally after in 2017, I said, you know, I think we, I'd like to create our own podcast show and just kind of talk about this stuff that we've encountered. And that was the original goal of it. Really. It was just kind of us. <laughs> kind of like we'd be around campfire and just kind of start it. And so I made Lane the first guest and we talked about his encounter just outside of Watonga. And then we were going to talk about a lot of things in going hunting now that uh, it clearly in, in our eyes, what was going on was that we had Bigfoot around the encampment. We had him come into camp. We had tarps lifted up on our tent. We had, um, tree crashes while we were at a campfire, massive tree crashes, uh, huge trees fall. Uh, we had whistling going on. We had, uh, my nephew, uh, saw one, uh, raise up from behind a tree and then duck back down, raise up and duck back down. And the Bigfoot didn't see that he was seeing him. So we, we had these and we would kind of go out on these excursions prior to the podcast show years before and just kind of look around. We didn't know really what we were looking for. We were looking primarily for prints, Um, we didn't know at that time about tree structures or anything, but we just knew something was out there and we wanted to see it. We didn't know the dangers in seeing these that how aggressive they could be, of course. Um, but that's, uh, you know, after that in the podcast, we really hit the trail and we were out in the field quite often after that. Was this, were you going to like a deer lease? No, um, we, my brother now has property in Pushmataha County that he just acquired this, uh, past six months, but we were going on public 
uh, land, wildlife management land. Now, a lot of the wildlife management land in Oklahoma, obviously, all the hunting land, you re- it requires a license, obviously, of the game that you're hunting. But some of the, uh, like the uh, Three Rivers Wildlife Management Area, requires an additional permit mm-hmm. uh, as a resident. So once you have that additional permit and you have your license, you can go anywhere your heart's desire. There is a map that they have, and you have to stay within those boundaries. Um, of course, the game warden in those areas will tell you exactly you know, uh, you know, if, if they have time, they will take you. Uh, if you say, I want to go on the most remote part of this uh, uh, wildlife management area, they will take you deep. Um, they know those areas quite well. And years and years ago, there was pro- I had heard there was over like uh, 600 thousand or 700,000 acres on Thurber's Wildlife Management. It's actually owned by the um, timber company and and they lease it out to the Oklahoma Wildlife to uh, manage it during the hunting season. So Wirehouser Logging Roads, the Wirehousing Logging Company who owns it, which I think it extends over into Arkansas as well. They uh, basically uh, manage timber, the uh, knotty pines and the poplali pines in that area. And so it's a beautiful part of Oklahoma that very few people know that exist. But uh, you've got pine trees 60, 80, uh, 90 feet in height down there. Uh, but it is uh, an amazing, mountainous, uh, beautiful Clearwater Creek bottom area with plenty of cover, plenty of game. And that's where we've had a lot of, uh, we've heard amazing vocalizations down there at night. Uh, like I said earlier, we had uh, our tarp that we would have on our tents lifted up at night. It, it was quite, it, it was fascinating. I think they were fascinated with us. And we always camped in the same spot year after year. So I think in an odd way, but I knew this, and I can't tell you how I knew it, I knew that they knew we were the same people coming back year after year. We had the same vehicles, same sounds. We camped in the same spot. I always camped in the same spot typically. And I just, I think they felt like, uh, Oh, there's our group again. Let's, uh, let's go in at night. You know, um, I know that sounds kind of odd, but I, I think they, by camping in the same spot year after year, I think that they became more comfortable and they got closer in the camp every year. I mean, I believe it. Uh, you're certainly not the first person to put out there that they believe that these things remember who they are. Uh, you have a lot of situations, it seems, where people have them coming onto their property up to the house and over time the activity turns more and more frequent less aggressive and these things eventually seem to i don't want to say the word habituate because that used to be a really bad word but they uh become used to the person so to speak and Mm -hmm. uh, really let their guard down as far as staying concealed and staying hidden it's almost like they don't care anymore because they know they're not going to be in any harm's way or anything um, yeah, that's a good point. I think you're right. Uh, I mean, we carried firearms, obviously, all the time, but we didn't walk brandishing them, of course. You know, we would uh, shoulder them or we had a pistol on our side, but, uh, you know, there's no need to pull anything when you're, uh, number one, you're just trying not to fall down. It's rocky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, the last thing you want to do is holding a firearm in your hand while you're moving. But I think they knew that uh, we wouldn't, you know, try to harm them. Uh, What's interesting too, that I've noticed over the years while we camp, when we had these events that we had uh, a lot of interesting things happen to our tents, pulling of tarps, pulling of tents. uh, We never had any surrounding camp um, light on, you know, we had these, uh, it was just pitch black. So when you walked outside, you you had to have we all had these uh, these headlamps on uh, LEDs quite bright and we that's how we would get around at night uh, if you want to go to the bathroom or you needed to 
you know, grab some medication or someone needed to, you know, whatever. Uh, you always had these headlamps on, but we never had any camp lighting. The times where we never had any camp lighting on is when we had a lot of things happen. Uh, when we started at the very end, having these all night LED lights or these propane um, uh, lanterns on, things just kind of, I don't want to say it entirely stopped, but it stopped at the outer perimeter where our lights kind of stopped really giving any visual. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I found, I found that interesting as well. Of course, that doesn't make, that's, that's no surprise uh, who wants to walk where they're seen, but we still had things come up in the outer perimeters. People talk about hearing uh, some form of spoken communication, a language. Uh, have you ever experienced that while camping out there or anywhere? Um, well, I don't want to say it was a language in the sense that, you know, obviously how humans communicate, but that did, did, do I think it meant something? Absolutely. I think it was communication between another. Um, so my brothers, we all have separate incidences, which we were with someone else that we heard something that just was quite terrifying. But um, I'll give you an example here. Um, Lane was with a friend of his, a Vietnam vet, and they were down outside of uh, Fay, Oklahoma, down on that South Canadian river bottom, which is very, very thick and woolly. So they were hog hunting, and it was a beautiful night. It was really crisp and cold. I think he said it was in January, and – it, it was crisp. It was beautiful. The moon was out. And so they just stayed a little bit longer. And it was about midnight. And they were sitting on the edge of this uh, of the riverbank. And the river, it was only as deep as maybe at some places, two, three feet deep. But for the most part, you could easily just wade across the river. Uh, it wasn't really a flowing river. Uh, and the hogs would go down there, and you could hear them all around you. So they were hog hunting. But they decided to go ahead and stop and just enjoy the evening. And while they were down there at midnight... And it was very quiet. All of a sudden, right across the river, Lane said the most god-awful sound. It was just a just a yell, scream combination that just penetrated their chest. And it almost was directed at them. And it, it definitely took them by surprise out of the silence of the night. And Lane's friend, his buddy, said, what the hell was that? And Lane said, if I told you, I don't know if you would believe me. And he said, try me. He said, you just heard a Sasquatch, and it doesn't like us here. He said, I've never seen one, but I will agree with you. It, that sound did not want us here. Well, it wasn't. 30 seconds later, and it sounded like it was still on the uh, the opposite side of the river, but down further, you heard it again, but it was by something like about another half a mile down, the same type of scream and yell. So it was almost after that second time, Lane said, I think it's time to go. I, I just get this feeling we're disrupting their uh, hunting ground. Uh, possibly because there was, it was thick with hogs. Um, now when I was at deer camp one evening, when we were down in three rivers and this, I remember vividly, I couldn't sleep that night cause it was so quiet and I was used to car sounds and city sounds and I was having a hard time tossing and turning. And so I was just barely kind of that sleep awake time And at 4, right on the dot, almost at 4 a.m., we heard this, uh, and Bill was asleep. He didn't get to hear this, and I didn't have any recording going. I wish I had. Um, But it was the siren call. It it, It was at a distance, but you could tell that this Bigfoot had a set of lungs. It was just this, it was a sustained yell that lasted about, 10, 12 seconds, it was, oh, 
thought it just, it went on, but it had, it was like a massive ship horn. And, and then there was a period where it, it broke and then it, about a lag of two to three seconds and it started again. And then it lasted 10 to 12 seconds and then it had a break of two to three and then it did it again. And then no one in the camp, it, there was no lights in the camp. No one said a word. And I'm like, that's crazy. I'm laying there. I set up. I said, that's crazy. I know what that is. I got up. I unzipped my tent. I didn't turn any headlight on. I My eyes were adjusted to the dark. And I walked toward Lane's tent. Lane was all ready, and he had a little fire going because he was used to his time schedule of getting up early with his job. And so he uh, basically – he uh, – he uh, – he said, did you hear that? I said, well, of course I heard that. And he goes, you know what that is? I said, absolutely. I know what that is. And so I was standing there and I said, well, I'm going to try to get some more shut eye. I'm going to go back to the camp. I'll go back to my tent. And I laid there no sooner than about another 10 minutes. And it was four, I think it was about 4.33 AM. And then right down our road, we heard the, the whoops. Whoop. And then a third, a second one. And then a third one, and it was so loud, and I said, okay, I'm coming out again. So then I went back over to Lane's tent, and I said, let's go down the road here. So we were the only two that were up yet. We took our uh, lamps. We put them on a, the, the uh, red lamp, so it, it really wasn't bright white light, the LED, and we just quietly walked down the road and did make a lot of racket. We didn't take any firearms, nothing like that. I didn't know really what we were doing. I just said, let's go. We might bump into something. Um, Of course, we didn't. We didn't yell. We didn't do anything. We just walked in about 200 yards down the road. We came back. Uh, That morning, we made coffee. We're sitting around the campfire. My dad said, "Uh, you boys hear anything interesting last night? I said, well, yeah, possibly. What would you hear? And he goes, well, I heard something I've never heard before. And, you know, my dad, he's hunted and fished and trapped all his life. And uh, we talked about this. And he says, well, how come I've never seen one? I said, well, I, I, I can't really answer that, Dad. But what I can say, how do you know something hasn't seen you and decided not to reveal itself? That's what we'll never know. So after that particular incident, it was just kind of a huh to him. Now, did this siren call, does it mean something? I, I think – Personally, with me, I think they knew we were obviously there. I think it was a, and I know this is going to sound somewhat silly because I can't prove this, but this is just my opinion. It's almost like this is my territory. I know you're here. And then the whoops later was almost like, you know, I asked Lane about this. He said, yeah, it's almost like, yeah, they're down here. They're down here. Uh, We never heard anything in the remaining camp. Um, but then following year, my dad had a visit to his tent that I think it scared him. Uh, we woke up with my dad yelling. Um, he heard river rocks clacking. It woke him up. He set up and then right on the outside of the tent, he heard this heavily, as he said, a guttural respiration on the exhalation and on the inhalation. Like he called it someone with bad, bad adenoids that were swollen, just, uh, just, uh, and I said, well, and he mentioned this the next day at coffee about midway through. And I said, well, why didn't you tell us, you know, first thing is, well, I just thought it was a, a, a bear. I said, well, that's possible. Absolutely. I said, was the sound low or was it high? And he, he said, well, it was high. I said, like how high? He says, well, like almost to the top He had this gazebo that he made into a tent, and so it was quite tall, and it was at the top of the gazebo Hmm. that he heard this sound. So, I I mean, we've heard – I've not heard the samurai chatter with the exception that Lane this past year went to my brother's property in Pushmataha, and he said that he was laying in the tent. They heard something. They were in visiting. They heard something, steps run by the tent, like dum, 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 dum. And my brother and a friend looked at each other and he said, did you hear that? And he said, yeah, I heard that. So they're sitting there visiting a little bit. My other brother didn't hear it. They're sitting there visiting and about 20 minutes later they hear, 
run by the tent. And Lane goes, that's it. I'm done. I'm going out of here. I got to see what this is. So Lane pop zips out the tent. He comes out and he's shining his light. Nothing. They don't see anything. They look for tracks, nothing, no prints, tracks, nothing. So it was about bedtime. They each go to their uh, tent, which are split about 25 yards apart. Lane's right near the wood line. And Lane told me this was last year. Yeah. Just this last fall. He said he's laying there. It's quiet. Then all of a sudden he hears this, what he describes as a bad owl sound that goes into a howling sound that goes into this samurai chatter. So it's like, who, 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 you know, just starts into this. And then Lane gets a text immediately from his friend that's camping across from him about 40 yards and says, what the hell's going on behind you? <laughs> and Lane says, I don't know, but I've got my firearm across my chest right now, which, you know, Lane said, I couldn't sleep at all, Lance, after that. He goes, I was awake for hours, but it, it didn't go on for a long time, but it was just so strange it went from a – bad owl to a bad coyote howl to this samurai chatter that lasted only just a few seconds and that was it so that's all that i can collectively think about right now but i've never heard anything per se you know of course like the sierra sounds by no means but uh that's kind of the collective sounds that we've heard thus far you know i find something interesting with you talking about your father uh being a lifelong hunter and everything and he you know mentioning like a lot of hunters do well mm -hmm. i've spent so much time out there why haven't i seen one yet here he is mentioning sounds he heard at night and not saying i heard a bear last night or not mentioning it at all like you know what I mean? Hunters don't talk about well, seeing deer. They see deer all the time. Well, he, he almost said it in passing like he knew it was odd, but he said it just kind of in a jest and in passing midday, not in the morning when we were all up. We'd already got around at breakfast, and it was almost like a little bit of a, well, you know, I, I heard something last night, and I wonder, and this is my take on it, my dad is from a generation that you didn't talk about stuff like that because mm -hmm. you might be viewed as a little goofy. Right. And I, and I, I, I can't help but think that's a portion of it. But my dad, we had this conversation at one of the camps one year, and it's very interesting how this developed. We were talking about, as we always do, we talk about Lane's experience and about the experiences we've had just collectively, we, we kind of banter across, you know, what do you think about this? And what do you think that meant? And what do you think that meant? And so, you know, we have the privilege, we've had these experiences, we can kind of talk about this stuff and bounce things off each other. And as we were talking about Lane's encounter that he had with his buddy outside of Watonga, it, it was very strange at that moment. My dad said, well, uh, do they make tools? Do they make you know, do they make tools? Do they, and I said, well, what do you mean tools? He goes, well, if they're a archaic type of nomadic type of being, most of the nomadic type of people, humans, made tools. I said, well, I, I'm not. I don't know. You're you're talking to the wrong guy. I said, I know quite a bit, but I don't know that because I I I don't I don't live among them, Dad, and. He, it was really interesting at that moment. I said, things developed in the conversation. And I said, well, what do you think Lane saw? Because my brother Lane, he's never deviated from the details of what happened. And he's retold that story, that encounter. And I tried to talk to Eddie, uh, his buddy. And, it, and Eddie's the type that he doesn't want to talk about it. He just confirmed whatever Lane said we saw, that's what we saw. And I don't really want to talk about it, Lance. It, it, it scared him. And I understand, but my dad got really mad and I said, so what do you think Lane saw? And he said, I think he saw a Brahma bull. And I said, so wow. <laughs> yeah. And I said, so this is your son. You're saying that you're not really hearing what he's saying. I said, dad, it's okay to be scared. 
that you don't want to acknowledge something like this exists because it, it's out of the norm. I said, I understand it, and it's okay because it it's very surreal that we're even talking about this. I said, but to not acknowledge what he saw is a whole different thing in my opinion. He said he saw a Brahma bull. It was just a misrepresentation. And Lane was right there. I said, well, you, you know, Lane's sitting right here. <laughs> and uh, Lane just got up and looked at me and rolled his eyes. And uh, and I said, uh, well, Dad, you know, it's okay that you can think what it is. But, uh, you know, Eddie the, and my dad knew his buddy. I said, Eddie corroborated the story. And it was still light enough that Lane saw what was going on and he was hanging out the door looking at this creature running after and Lane had a gun pointing at it but did not uh, fire on it because he didn't know what was going on. It scared him, but it looked more human, but it didn't look human. So uh, my dad, I think, over time has changed his opinion, but he's heard things. And the reason why he's changed the opinion is because of what we've experienced at that deer camp. Did he ever talk about hearing the rock clacking, what he thought that could have been? I, we have. I actually interviewed him. When he started to hear the things that we were hearing at night, I would hear things, and I would say, we had walkie-talkies, and I would say, Dad, you up? Dad, Dad. And then he'd go, yeah, yeah, what's wrong? And I said, listen, listen, you should be quiet. Do you hear that outside your tent? Do you hear the utensils that you laid on the table clacking around? Did you put them low or did you put them up high? He goes, I hung them. They're, they're on the outside of the uh, gazebo. I said, if you listen, they're being messed with right now. So when he would – I would state the obvious to him. He would then say – you know, you're right. So it's almost like he didn't want to acknowledge things, but when I would point out the obvious, then he would go, well, yeah, a raccoon can't get up that high. Now, what are they standing on? Uh, you know, so he started acknowledging things a bit more. And so I did an interview with him on that very thing with the rocks clacking. And he says, I don't know to this day. I can only tell you that that siren sound that we, you say it's a siren sound. I heard that. I've never heard that before in my life. That whooping sound, he says, it sounds like a, a, a gibbon monkey that night. And I said, okay. Uh, and I said, what about the rock clacking and about these these sounds, these gutter roll, these bad adenoid sounds? He goes, well, I don't know because I've heard bears before and I've never heard that before in my life. And he said, when he said, get on out of here, get, get, and he was yelling that woke the rest of us up. He heard the, this clacking of the rocks as if it was walking back on the rocks it walked away down uh, the creek so i think it's now put a a a bug if you will in him that there may be things out there that's more mysterious that he's just not aware of that um you know maybe over the years for whatever reasons Uh, And I said, well, dad, when you go hunting, did you always have a bow in your hand or a gun in your hand when you're out? Because he did a lot of stalking. And he says, well, of course. I said, so picture if you were one of these Bigfoot and you were observing you, what is the likelihood you would step out if you knew something in that human's hand might harm you? He goes, I probably wouldn't step out. I said, well, that's just something possible to think about. So he's come around a little bit. He's never had an encounter I know some of the things that we've uh, – I told him one time, he, he one of the last trips we made down that way, he put his deer stand way down in the bottom area. We kind of nicknamed Bear Trap, and it's so thick down there. And Lane and a friend of my brother brothers went down there, and, and they had an experience down there. Something kind of stalked around them but never made itself visible. And my dad put his deer stand on the back side. He was the only one that year – and I told my dad, I, he came up to me and he said, now, um, I, uh, he was kind of hee-hawing around. I said, what, what, what? We're getting ready to leave. He said, if I see one of these uh, Bigfoot, uh, what, what do I do? I said, well, I would not shoot it first off. Don't go picking a fight. I said, if you see one, just sit there and see how its body posture is, what it's going to do. I said, but the last thing I would do was point anything 
at it. Just let it be until if it's if you see an aggressive posture or something, then if you can get down out of your stand slowly and back away and go back to your truck, then do that. So he went, he left in his stand, but the odd thing is he never got back in that stand the whole time we were there. Huh. So I don't think he saw anything because I asked him. He said, no, no, I didn't see anything, but he just didn't want to go back. Uh, I think because down in that bottom area we were at was really kind of spooky when it gets uh, starts getting dark. And it gets dark fast, of course, in the fall. Have you guys seen a lot of bears down there? Uh, we've seen a couple. Uh, we've caught them on game camera, and we've caught a couple on uh, some trails that were uh, down in that bottom I just spoke about. Uh, pretty good sized bears, I would say at least uh, two fifty to three hundred pounders. I've noticed here lately um, a lot of the news agencies are talking about black bears here in Oklahoma. Uh, telling people about them and, you know, what to do if you spot one, you know, how to react and everything. And I read one article that said uh, eastern Oklahoma, they guesstimate the population around 3,000 uh, currently. I was just wow. curious, like, what's your take? Uh, the question used to always come up about, well, Bigfoot are just, you know, misidentified bear sightings and i always thought you know the flip side will how many bigfoot sightings are actually bigfoot sightings but it's you know being yeah, that's a know, great they're point calling it a bear because they expect it to be a bear and not a bigfoot mm -hmm. uh, do, do you think that happens is there oh, something absolutely. going on with that i think there is it's you know it's a. Uh, <laughs> I was talking to some gentlemen the other night and uh uh, we were, we were talking about, you know, going in the woods and, uh, I wish my brothers and I could all get together. Everybody seems to be busier and busier now that, uh, some have, you know, job relocated here and there. So I do a lot of investigation by myself, which I don't recommend to people by the way. Um, but I, I've got contingency plans that I've, you know, hey, worked out. And you're, my, you're the 17 year old that ran through the canyons in the dark. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right so ahead. I told my, I told my wife, you know, where I go, she knows exactly. I leave it. I say, I pin a map. This is where I'll be. This is what time I'm going to go out of there. And this is, and I usually will call her when I get to my destination, if I'm sitting at a location or whatever. So I, I I'm really good about doing that. But, um, I, I think you're right. Uh, I'm the type that I'm more inclined if I hear some, a, a twig break or I don't say that's a Bigfoot. Uh, the guys the other night I was talking to, they said, uh, it's a woo Bigfoot, you know? And I said, well, uh, I, I think just because I've hunted so much since a kid, I tend to lean more toward the indigenous wildlife. Uh, so that's what I, I do. It, it really has, has to almost step out in front of me for me or hear a, a vocalization for me to say, okay, that's not indigenous wildlife. That's something different. Or, uh, but I tend to believe more that I think, I, I think you have a good point. I think it goes both ways. I think a lot of people, if a bear is climbing up a tree and is hung on a tree lengthways and it is, it has a side profile and someone's driving by, look at that Bigfoot standing there. Um, that, could happen and i think though uh if there, especially if the more the the higher prevalence uh, of the numbers increasing in eastern oklahoma i'm absolutely you know uh certain that happens but you know when you said that about bigfoot being misidentified as black bears it brought a uh, i just thought of a story i hadn't heard of a uh, for a long time, I remember when we went to Watonga, when I was starting high school from eighth to ninth grade, there was a story that would circulate every once in a while. And the the irony here is that the high schoolers that, that where my brother had that encounter, that was a well-known party area where they would go down and have bonfires. And that was west of Watonga. Now I'd never been down that. I went. I've been back, of course, after Lane had that. But ironically, that whole area is fenced off now. You can't get to it. But what was interesting is that the story around school was that 
Bobo, the long haired man would get you. And they would say, Hey, I saw Bo the other day. And I would overhear conversations in the hallway to say, Hey, what were you doing? Well, I was down at that party area and I saw it walking in the trees. You know, I just kind of leave him alone. And I wonder, and that was the same area where Lane had his encounter. I just wonder now if that was a misidentification. They were actually seeing a Bigfoot walking around down in that bottom. I think it's absolutely possible. Um, and to be clear, Bobo, the long-haired man, is not James Bobo Fay from Finding Bigfoot in the BFR. Oh, no. Oh, no. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. long-haired Bobo. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah, I forgot about that. But, no, I mean, typically people – uh, aren't interested in Bigfoot. They don't think it's real. They don't give it a second thought. You know, it's just something on a TV commercial or, you know, Harry from Harry and the Hendersons. And if they're a tourist or they're out camping, you know, having their little weekend adventure and they see something large and hairy in the woods, they're just going to assume that it's a bear. Or even if it's somebody that lives in the area and knows bears are in the area and they've seen bears their whole life, and then they see a glimpse of something covered in hair, oh, well, that just must be a bear. And in the same token, oh, that's just, you know, an old hobo that lives in the woods. It's just some man, you know, an old hermit or something. Uh, My great-grandmother was actually uh, one of the first people to say that to me after I had been into Bigfoot for years, you know, and she would just give me absolute hell about going out and looking for Bigfoot. And any time a relative came over, do you know what Matt does? He goes out there and looks for Bigfoot, you know, and she would just get a big old kick out of it. And then one day I said something, I was talking and I mentioned the word boogers. And she said, oh, well, I know what those are. And I was like, yeah, they're Bigfoot. And she said, no, those are the old, those wild men that lived up in the mountains in Arkansas whenever I was a kid. Oh, interesting. And that's how, like, she learned about it. And there's just so many regional variances and everything. And in this part of the country especially, a lot of people talk about, you know, mountain men and wild men living in the woods and everything and not making the connection to Bigfoot at all. Um, because a lot of times they're not the giant 10 foot, you know, patty built thing, you know, they look like a person covered in hair pretty much. Exactly. Exactly. And I think there's a lot of misidentification because you hit it right on the head, Matt, is that I think a lot of people still think it's a campfire, uh, you know, folklore Mm -hmm. campfire, good campfire story. And so therefore in their mind, they've already, they've already titled or placed that image of a Bigfoot being, still in the Northwest territories of the U S and right. that it's um, it can't be here because we're in the plains of Kansas or we're in the plains of Oklahoma or we're in Oklahoma. Uh, it is just that silliness uh, that, that doesn't exist. It's just your imagination's running wild. So when someone sees something that doesn't quite fit in their parallel of what their reference is, they'll look at it and they'll go, huh, now, I don't mean an up-close encounter, but something possibly at a distance or something that went across right. the road, and they'll look at it and they'll think, okay, that was a little different. It was upright, and then they'll pass that area. They won't get out, but it'll just always be a little bit of a moment where they're like, well, now that's strange, a man in a monkey suit that just crossed the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, well, okay, that's nice. Uh, let's go on, and we were going to meet at Walmart. Is that right? You know, it's like it just, they don't give it, they don't connect a dot or they or their mind says, don't waste any time on that because that's not real what I just saw. And it's kind of hard. I, I like to get into the psychology of that a lot um, because I'm always fascinated how the brain works and what drives people that, to get angry when they have an encounter and what people and some people have this immense fear uh, that leads into an obsession. And I totally get that as well. So, uh, but I think you're onto something with that too. Just people just, it's, a, you won't convince people that's not had 
encounter or a uh, up close sighting. It's just impossible. Uh, I don't even try. Um, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, I used to lead off with, uh, whenever people had asked me about, you know, my experiences is I would flat out tell them, look, I'm not asking you to believe anything I'm saying. I'm just telling you what I experienced. And I absolutely understand that it's something where you have to experience it for yourself before you're ever going to really understand or grasp it. Because whenever I started, I, even you know, like once again, Dan and Vicky, like I said, I cut my teeth with those guys. Uh, it was a whole group of people. And here are these people who have been involved much longer than I have and telling me all these crazy stories. And I got to know them on a personal level. I got to know the people that they were to the point where I was like, you know, these are, they remind me a lot of my grandparents and that side of my family, you know, like rural Oklahoma people that don't make up stories. They don't lie. You know, it's not in their nature to do things like that. They might kid around and joke sometimes, but you know, they're telling me that this happened, but I, I don't really know what to think of it. I mean, I believe them, but whenever I had my own encounter and the world came crashing down on me, that's when I realized I never really believed it before until now. It's not that I thought they were lying. It was just something that I couldn't really wrap my head around like I thought I was. I don't think I've heard that. Do you mind sharing that with me? What what, what happened? <laughs> oh, come on now. You're the guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, I, you know, I grew up with an interest in the subject, um, just all of the unexplained stuff interested me. And eventually I got a computer and one night I was up on the computer learning what was on the internet. And I typed in the word Bigfoot and, uh, found out that, you know, people actually go out and look for these things. I couldn't believe it. And eventually I found out that people in Oklahoma go out and look for them. And there are sightings, and people say that these things are out there. And I ended up with a group, and they were actively going out into the field. And I joined up with them and went out with them. And we were down in Sulphur in the park. And it was a group outing. It wasn't a serious one or anything. Uh, we were actually having a group barbecue. It was more of a social function. But there are sightings in the park. There's locals with us in the group. They knew some spots to go to, so we would go and look around, not expecting anything to happen. And uh, right. we were by the Nature Center in a parking lot, actually. And I, I hate saying that because it paints a picture as soon as people hear the word parking lot. Like, how can you have a Bigfoot sighting in a parking lot? Well, you got to mm -hmm. understand this parking lot's in the middle of the forest. It's not just, you know, a Walmart parking lot. No, right. And, uh, okay. One of the group members had a, a night vision scope he was using. It was actually Dan Rickey's night vision scope. I think it was a, uh, oh, okay. a, a gen two or a gen three. That was like the best you could get at the time. It was, um, actually a rifle scope that Dan had fashioned to use as a handheld device, a monoscope. Oh, okay. And, uh, the rest of the group had kind of separated and walked off down a ways from us. They were probably a couple of hundred yards away. And it was just me and this other guy back there. And, uh, he was over kind of towards the tree line and by the tree line where you have, you know, the parking lot. And then there's like mowed grass or brush hogged or something. It's kind of clear cut right there. And then you have the tree line and there's probably a 30 foot gap between the parking lot and the tree line. And he's standing in the grass there right at the edge of the parking lot. And he kind of, you know, Matt, come here. And I walk over there mm. and he's like, look through this and see if you see what I'm seeing. And that's all he said. And I pull the oh, wow. scope up and I'm looking around and you know, he's kind of, can you see my hand? Yeah. And he's like, kind of look over that direction. Look for the eye shine. And that's what I saw. I saw eye shine. 
Um, so my focus is on the eyes and I'm looking at an angle into the tree line through cover. And there's these branches mm-hmm. kind of separated, uh, like a sideways triangle. I guess a triangle is always sideways, but <laughs> you know, there's the gap <laughs> and it comes at an angle. Right. And I see these bright, bright, large eyes shining back in the night vision. And that's what I'm really focused on. And I'm just trying to, you know, okay, eye shine. Is it a deer? You know, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to process it because I know what I'm I'm seeing a face, Um, not a human face, but a face. It has a nose. It has two eyes. It has a mouth. It's looking. It looks like it's looking right back at me. Oh, wow. And as I'm staring at it, it's coming, you know, into focus because it goes from like, I'm looking at the bright reflection of the eyes and, you know, the face surrounding Mm -hmm. it. And I see the tree limb, it's going across like its chin area. And then the other tree Mm -hmm. limb is going kind of across above its brow ridge that it had. So I couldn't see the bottom of the face or the top of the head. Um, it had the, the bridge of the nose didn't stick out like ours. It was still visible, but it, I remember it being real thin and flaring out to a wide flat nose with slightly upturned nostrils. It didn't have like a nose tip like we do, like the bulb at the tip of Mm -hmm. our nose. It didn't have that. The brow ridge was very thick and heavy. The eyes were deep set. And the brow ridge, in a lot of artwork, you see a separation in the middle of the brow ridge with right. kind of two separate brow ridges. And this wasn't that. It didn't. It was just one solid brow ridge line. There was no forehead. Hmm. The hair grew back like if your eyebrows just grew back over the top of your head in a backwards fashion. The cheekbones oh. were very prominent and set really high. And then... It widened out and flared out to a very broad jaw. The mouth sat right below the nose. It did not have like that monkey looking mouth to it at all. The mouth was wide, uh, very thin lips, but the lips were visible and it had what looked like an underbite. Its bottom lip was clearly jutted out farther than its top lip. I didn't see Mm. any ears or anything like that. The hair pattern was just like a human male that let his facial hair grow, you know, like clear around the eyes and the nose and everything. But then it was thinner and like grew longer as it, you know, went back around the sides of the head and everything. And at that point, I don't know how long I had been staring at it and it blinked a couple times. That also caught my attention. I don't even know if I've ever talked about the blinks before. Interesting. So I pulled the scope down. Now keep in mind, I'm a newbie, <laughs> you know, I haven't yeah, been doing yeah. this long at all. So wow. what happens when you're staring through a night vision scope? You're blind. So like, <laughs> right. I've got, you know, like scope eye going on and I can hardly see and I'm squinting <laughs> one eye and I'm looking at him. And I was like, is that a face? And he's like, it, you know, it sure the hell looks like one to me. And I pull the scope back up to look at it again and it's gone. No sound, nothing, just gone. And the, the gap where I had been looking at its face was now gone. Those two branches were come together. So I think it was holding a branch down and separating oh, them and looking at us through the branches. And, uh, I mean, that was it, man. That, that, <laughs> that set me wow. on a full blown path from that point out. Like, okay, well I'm doing this all the time now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a uh, intro into this uh, field. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I might have gone out a, a couple times before that. Nothing major. Lots of talking about it, you know. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I had gone down to Texas. Uh, that was my big first uh, outing with the group and everything was down in eastern Texas. And they had just had one of the craziest uh outings of all time the the whole 
caravan of people driving into the woods had a whole group of Bigfoot cross the road in front of them where like multiple oh. people saw it and everything. Uh, oh, wow. And we went down there uh, about a month later. Uh, the following month, I didn't go on the first trip, but I went on the follow-up trip. And uh, Lance, this is one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. We found what looked like tracks going across the dirt roads um but the track (laughs) there's the the roads are like red dirt you know like we have here in oklahoma but much thinner and sandier um well i guess out there by weatherford and everything it gets pretty sandy on those roads um but these human shaped Footprints, I, I, I'm going to call them footprints, with mm-hmm. these huge strides, there would be like three of them in a pattern going across the road, but they were packed down, filled with dirt from a different place. Like somebody had come in and covered up the tracks with this other dirt. What? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, okay, do I know this for a fact? No, but it was like somebody in the know came in with a truck or something and a shovel with a pile of dirt on the back and filled those tracks in so people wouldn't see them. Yeah, interesting. It was one of the strangest things I've ever encountered. I've heard lots of stories. I'm sure you've heard them too about weird run-ins with government officials, you know, and men in black and, you know, the government covering things up and everything. I've never personally experienced that. I've talked to people that I trust who say they have, and I've heard some incredible stories, but I don't have any explanation for that. And it happened in the same place where, you know, these people that I knew said they saw a whole group of them crossing the road. And it was just the strangest thing. I, I have no explanation for it. Yeah, I mean, we're in Oklahoma, you know, pothole capital of the world. I've seen people fill in potholes, <laughs> you know. These were not Oh, potholes, yeah, absolutely. Though. I mean, these were like footprints going across a road filled in with dirt from a different location. That reminds me of the uh, a, a story, and I don't even know if I can get on it and find it anymore. Last time I tried, I couldn't find it. But it was, a, I, I can't even remember the individual that did the interview. It, it was quite good. They were interviewing a, a state investigator. Uh, I believe his name was Dave Davies. And he was out of Tulsa, I believe. And he was called to a casino in a very, very small community north of Oklahoma City, or just a little, no, excuse me, it was north of El Reno. Yeah, the lucky star. Yep. And so, um, as things transpired, of course, they caught a Bigfoot on the security camera and walking across the parking lot, ultimately going to the grease trap, lifting up the, the uh, bin, closing it, walking back. Um, well, they called. Dave Davies out there, this gentleman, and he reviewed the tape. He got to review it as many times as he wanted. The manager of the casino let him, and so he was explaining this during a separate interview that he met with another gentleman at a cafe. And in the process, uh, excuse me, so a few days went by, and the the state investigator got a call, please come back, we have some people out here that we don't know who they are, and they're not listening to us. So by the time he got out there, they had already dis- disappeared or gone. They left the, the premises. But the manager of the uh, – and he, he described this, that the manager had told him, and uh, Dave Davies was talking about this in an interview, that the manager was approached by some people uh, in a van and some cars out back that were casting these prints that led into a field that had been plowed just uh, – on the outskirts of this uh, casino parking lot, which was just a, uh, sometimes uh, farm fields go right up to parking lots and things like that. And that after they were casting these prints, they would pull them out. And then they were taking, there was another gentleman uh, that was 
uh, again, this is uh, what the state investigator is saying, uh, that the manager of the casino had said that he was taking brush and he was wiping over all of the prints in the field, um, kind of erasing these tracks. Wow. Uh, so I found that interesting. That was such a fascinating interview because it was an interview with what the state investigator was told what he saw, uh, and he was just kind of like a David Politis, just a, here's the facts, just tell me the facts kind of guy. Right. So I found it really, really interesting because he was he was a active state investigator, called into the scene, and he was asked during the interview, you know, what did you see on the footage? He goes, well, I saw a very large, uh, upright being that was covered in hair, that was extremely tall because I recognized I could see the security camera that this being ducked under and we measured that and it was over nine feet tall and it's made strides across the parking lot. It didn't take long for it to go to the grease trap. So in he was describing all of this, which was fascinating to me. I'm just like glued to this. Uh, I think I found this on one of the websites out of Texas but uh, I, I don't know, it just struck me for a second covering up those tracks and just what you said with the whole, with the prints being filled in with dirt that someone knew what they were and they didn't want them found. That, that's really interesting. I've never heard about that before. I mean, uh, I know people that worked at the casino uh, whenever that happened. I've heard tons of stories about the casino. I've talked to different people uh, that don't know one another all corroborate the same story um, and description of the video, but I have never heard about, uh, that before about a follow-up of strange, uh, agents of some Mm -hmm. kind, uh, casting the tracks and then destroying them. Yeah, it was, uh, if my memory serves me correct, it was, uh, it was titled, uh, Bigfoot on the Prairie or something of that nature, Bigfoot on the open, the Oklahoma Prairie. And it, it was a, I wish I could remember the gentleman that did the interview, but it was done in a cafe. So it tells me he just put a recorder on the table because right. you could hear the clanking of dishes and people in the background. And he was just asking the state investigator, tell me what you saw and what do you think? And was there any follow-up? He goes, well, matter of fact, there was, and just kind of went into that. So I, I found that fascinating. And of course, with the, some of the interviews that I've done of people, it's, it's no different. Uh, I don't personally think it's a coincidence that, from separate people, unrelated, different states, uh, seeing these Bigfoot creatures and or beings and then having, uh, not, on, not on all occasion, but just very unusual cir- circumstances of the interaction or event that transpired, there were people that showed up mm-hmm. uh, that had tags that had, if you will, government tags. Um I can hypothesize all day long what I who I think they are, but I would still probably be wrong. But I have a good suspicion, um, obviously, what they were looking at and wanting. Um, so, but anyway, uh, that's really really interesting. On that, uh, again, the tracks being covered up. What are some of the, what's an interesting story that stands out that you've heard from a guest on your show? Oh, do you have a favorite? Well, I should say it, it, it sticks out ones that stick out in my mind. I don't, I I guess if I'm partial to the word favorite, I, I want to be careful and say that it, it, it had an impression, a profound impression upon me because it really has changed this person's life and, and not for the better. So I, I hesitate to say favorite, but it, it just it impacted me in such a way that led me to what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm writing a book right now, but um, it would had to be the uh, episode, uh, the Ohio Bigfoot attack and Fed cover-up. Um, that was just, it, it almost lays out like a story that you just, reality, I say, is stranger than fiction. And it was just two cousins minding their own business. They were very close. They went on a fishing trip, which was very common, midday. 
in the afternoon. They went to a favorite reservoir in Ohio, and while they were fishing, uh, the cousin up front in the boat had these rocks, pebbles that started splashing the water. He thought the cousin behind him was doing it. He said, stop it. He said, stop what? So it kind of escalated to the point where the rocks weren't pebbles. They got larger, like a splash. He said, uh, you know, damn it, stop it. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. And then the cousin in the back said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I just saw something behind a tree up there on that island. They were fishing around this island, which there was, a, I guess, quite a few in this reservoir. He said, I saw something go behind that tree over there. And the cousin up front said, take me up there. I want to talk to that guy. He said, no, just leave him on. He goes, take me up there. They were in a flat John boat. Well, they got on the bank, and the uh, cousin up front took a handful of rocks that were on the shoreline and threw it at the tree. So he was obviously close enough to do this. He told me he was around 25 yards, maybe somewhere in there. But the unfortunate thing is that it wasn't a person. It was a it was a Bigfoot that was hiding behind the tree. And it with that kind of action, it was viewed as retaliation or an act of aggression, obviously, by the cousin. And so the Bigfoot stepped out and the second cousin said when the Bigfoot stepped out, it was as if someone painted a four by eight sheet of plywood. He does I don't know how he was able to conceal the size of his body, but he stepped out from behind this tree, and it was like a monster, he said. It, it bent down. It was on two legs. It bent down and gave this god-awful yell, and the lips curled when he yelled. He said it was so mad that when it, when it, when it, it was like a yell and scream, they just froze, and that the lip, as it curled the lip upward and the, na- the, the nasal flared, he said, it was the brightest pink I've ever seen. It was like that uh, 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 hubba bubba bubble gum yeah. that we as kids used to chew. He said it was like that, and it screamed, and we froze, and my cousin was up front of me. Um it just kind of escalated to that point where the cousin was hit by this Bigfoot. It came in so fast, hit him in the chest, knocked him back about, he said, 15 or so feet into the water. Uh, his cub is in, and it made a 90 just at a split second in front of him. It happened so fast. He didn't even see where his cousin, what had happened. He turned and his cousin was in the water and his cousin was grabbing his chest and gut he was just kind of an agony so we grabbed the cousin and this big was now on all fours and was just screaming and so he got into the water he had his cousin uh he didn't pay attention to bigfoot he was trying to get to the john boat just to get the hell out of there and in the process of trying to wade to the john boat uh he, he turned and looked over his shoulder, and he saw this this uh, log coming at him. He ducked. It hit his cousin. He was trying to help. Cold cocked him in the jaw, knocked him out. He's grabbing him. He's trying to throw him in the john boat. His cousin is knocked out temporarily. And then the, the cousin said, I come to the realization I actually was had a firearm on my side. So I grabbed my firearm. I'm in the water. I, I, my cousin's in the boat. I grabbed his firearm. He's still knocked out in the boat. And I put the boat between me and the Bigfoot. I'm waist deep in the water. And I've got the boat with my cousin laying knocked out in it. This Bigfoot is on the bank now yelling. And then it, it, gave, it gives a yell. I've got guns pointed. I'm, I'm shaking so bad. I, there's no way I would have even hit it if I fired and it ran away, he said in such a way that was unique. He said it kind of sideways galloped. It, it didn't go straight. It kind of sideways galloped with its head cocked back and its nose up in the air. And, and, it, and it went around the point of this Island. He said, he said, I was in such shock. I, 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 I stood there with the guns just shaking in my hands. He said, and then I just dumped the guns in the boat. I, I got myself into the boat. 
I went to the back and I started the motor and I just went right to the boat landing where we uh, unloaded the boat and he made calls and he called uh, the uh, ambulance. He called the sheriff. He called anyone he could. Uh, the highway patrol was there, the game warden and all these people. His, and so it just kind of builds. His cousin goes into the hospital and while he was there, he, uh, there was a police officer there and he, this cousin that I talked to, he just kept rambling. We saw a monster. We saw a monster. We saw a monster. It, it, it was, it, I don't know, Bigfoot. They, I guess they're real. And he was just rambling this. And a police officer called him out in the hall and he said, hey, um, I've seen him too. You need to call these guys. And I think they can, you know, talk to you about some stuff. And he gave a sheet of paper and it happened to be our number on it. Wow. And that's how he contacted me. Well, this goes on and on and on with the story, but um, it, it gets wild. It gets, uh, they go, they try, the cousin gets out. He broke, it punctured a law. Five minutes later, he said that him and his cousin were in the room with law enforcement and two guys show up uh, with suits that tell everyone to get out of the room. And even the uh, medical personnel leave, and it's just him and his cousin. And one of the guys says, you come with me, took him to a separate room. And he said, what happened? And so, of course, the cousin spills his guts, cousin that's in the bed. We don't know what was said there. Um, then the guys leave. Um, the cousin finally is released the following day. They, the cousin that got hurt, said, we got to tell people. He goes, let's go to the radio station. They're down at the radio station, and it's a local little radio station. And they said, we got a story to tell you. So the, the guy, the, the producer, I guess, said, yeah, yeah, we're going to break it in. So they're sitting there in the lobby, and they're getting ready to go on. And then all of a sudden, the electricity goes off to the whole radio station. And they're like, what's going on here? And so – um. The producer gets on the phone. He's making some calls, and he goes, okay, okay, and then he hangs up, and he said, you guys got to get out of here, and they said, what? We're going to go on the radio. He says, nope, you got to get out of here. I can't help you, and that's all that's said there, so they leave. It's just a, a series of strangeness, yeah. um, and it goes on and on and on. It was episode 24 of what we had, but... Anyway, I directed him. He, I said, just stop talking a lot about it right now. He, he didn't understand social media. He was one of those guys that really is not a computer guy. Uh, he goes home. He tries to explain to his wife what happened. They call the pastor in. He says, listen, this is what happened. And long story short here, I'll just say this. The guy ended up, uh, his wife left him. He lost his job. He lost his house. He lost his truck. Uh, his cousin didn't want anything to do with him. They both uh, kind of split apart, and it was just a series of bad events that transpired. In addition to that, prior to the wife leaving, their bank account was closed. Their savings account was closed, and therefore they lost their home. They couldn't even buy groceries. She was confused. She was mad. She was upset. Uh, you know, what did you do? He said, I didn't do anything. It's what happened, I think, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. I saw a monster. So it was just a very strange, odd situation that transpired from two cousins wanting to have a great afternoon and fish. And they basically came upon uh, this Bigfoot. And the cousin said he believes he saw another one on that island. So I think one Bigfoot thought, there was a threat, obviously throwing a handful of rocks. Now he's on the island, and he did. He tried to protect the the rest of the clan or the other members of this unit, and he did what he thought he had to do, which was actually make physical contact with the other cousin. Wow, I've heard a lot of people ask, you know, well, if if you're out there and you get these rocks thrown at you, has anybody ever thrown one back? What would happen? Well. There's your answer, folks. Don't do it. <laughs> do not do it. Yeah, don't. Absolutely don't do it. It's just that 
they don't understand humor or, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, you know. They just reactionary in my mind. They're very reactionary. They're reactionary to survive by instinct. When they hungry, they eat. Uh, when they're mad, they're mad. They react. So they're they don't have a sense of they don't understand a lot of our characteristics. I mean, I'm sure they have a sense of humor to a certain degree. I'm sure they do, uh, but that wasn't the time to throw a handful of rocks to see how they were going to respond. The guy didn't know what he was saying. He was thought he thought he was throwing rocks at a human, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. That's really interesting. I've got one more question. I have to ask you before we wrap things up. Sure. Sure. Um, (laughs) I got to know, man, tell me a dog man story. Tell me about the dog. Oh, Well, I know uh, we could go an entire another show about Dogman because <laughs> you are yeah. one of the few people out there that really, you know, put some research effort into the Dogman. Yeah. I I don't know, you know, man, it, it's I don't know what hit me that I just became obsessed with this um, Dogman creature. Um, I I. I, I just can't tell you what it is, but I just had, I just went all in. So uh, you're right. I could go on for another four hours, but I won't. I'll save you. Uh, we'll say this. The story that it's, it's either going to be Wiley Dave's encounter that he had, because uh, I know Wiley. It's one of those stories that I know the person very, very well. I know him. I know his hunting skills. I know his personality. And uh, I know he saw what he saw. Obviously, I wasn't there. We weren't friends yet. But to add to that story, and uh, that was an interview I did. Then after that interview, we became friends. But one of the wildest Dogman stories I just actually released, I waited three years. I promised the guy three years before I would release the story. And I just got it out last week. It, uh, I think it was five shows in a row that I did. And this was a gentleman that was, let's just say, a security detailed personnel. Um, he had really high clearance. Um, he was vague. And again, I know this is someone that you could easily say, well, Lance, how can you prove this? Well, I really can't, obviously. Uh I'm just taking the person's word at it. He did not, you know, with my years and background in, in healthcare, I'm using my past experiences to dictate if a person was malingering, you know, when I was in healthcare. But this person did not, uh, hmm, he gave direct, concise, immediate answers to my questions. He, we would always talk about from midnight to three and four in the morning every night for a long time. And I was so waiting, even though I was exhausted from work and staying up and had to get up the next morning, I still wanted to talk with him. He was on a security detail having to protect a very high person in the brass. And it was in a very remote location and he was responsible for setting setting up the security detail with him and his colleagues in the process of where this high brass official moved to, which was a very remote area. No one had moved in this location. They came across these dog man creatures that were a pack, if you will, that apparently there was a rich history of sightings in this area based on isolated neighbors in and around that same area. Uh, He spoke to the neighbors. Ironically, they were very vague, some of them. He tried to, in the evening, knock on the door, and he could see them, and they would not come to the door, and he would literally be banging on the door, which he found extremely odd, and he would find them in the daytime and say, hey, I was banging on your door to ask you some questions about some things we're seeing, and they go, "Uh, oh, 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 okay, that was you. And he goes, well, yeah, who would it be? And they go, uh... Well, sometimes they bang on the doors. And he said, say, Oh, that's they. frightening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he said, what do you mean they? And he said, well, they've been here a long time. And then he went to another lady that was working in her garden. 
And he said, ma'am, uh, we're so-and-so and we are in this direction and we're here setting up. He was very vague to them. He was trying to just collect some information with the area to say, you know, what the hell are these things? Um, and she said, oh, you mean my, uh, what'd she say? Something like my dog friends that walk upright. And he said, oh, okay, wh- whatever. Uh, what can you tell me about them? Oh, they leave you alone. They just come through my property every once in a while. And he goes, what do you mean every once in a while? They're, they come here frequently. And she said, oh, yes, yes. They, they don't bother me, but I just, uh, I just mind my own business. Um, then he went to another fa- a neighbor, and he said, uh, do, what do you know about this? And the, the, it's like the father turned away, didn't want to talk. And then the, the son, who was about 16 or 17, said, well, my dad doesn't like talking about this because we leave him alone, but we, we more or less help him. And this young man, this in the security detail, he said, what do you mean you help them? He said, well, when they come at the beginning of the season, we leave a horse out tied up for them. He said, tied up for what? He said, well, that's kind of what we do. We, we give them some food and they, they, they leave us alone. And so he's like, what? So it, it just transpires into this every evening talking to this gentleman about this, the tendencies, their characteristics, their habits. They're so frequented at this perimeter where they're, they set up the security fence for this high brass official that they've actually named each one of these. They can tell who's who because of their size. They know who the alpha male is. And it gets into this really bizarre intelligent ability that these creatures have, I was just jaw dropped every night. Um, That has to be one of the most eye opening, terrifying, uh, longest episode encounters that I've ever come across. Uh, The gentleman was extremely matter of fact he and his colleagues, and he would talk to me while he was on security detail monitoring every night these cameras. He was in a tower. Um, so, uh, again, can I absolutely unequivocally prove this? I, I, of course not. I wasn't there. But I can tell you out of many, many guests that I've had, he was a solid. He was matter-of-fact about things he could tell me. He was immediate. He did not hesitate. Um, he, he did not quiver in his voice. He was uh, direct. He was uh, just one of those people that didn't beat around the bush, if you will. Wow. He was, he was talking about the speed, the speed of the creatures that they would see them running in the field, um, running after cars of some of the colleagues that were leaving off work and they would try to increase the speed to 60, 65, and they were easily keeping up with the car. Um, he talked about having lunch laid out accidentally. Um, and they would, uh, uh, grab the lunch, eat their lunch. He talked about these creatures scaling the, uh, they had a 20 foot perimeter fence with Constantino wire. He said they crossed that like it was nothing. That does nothing. They, that's just, it's crazy. What are they? I mean, everybody always, on Bigfoot shows, you know, everybody, so what do you think Bigfoot is? I want to know, what is Dogman? How does that canine end up on two legs? This is something that has not only bothered me, fascinated with me, and kept me up many, many nights, just me pondering when everybody's in bed and my family and the, here's what I'm going to say. This is Lance's version of what I think they are. And I could I be way off base? Of course. But I think this is how I understand it. I truly believe that there is a, a biblical aspect to these creatures. I believe because of the many people that I've talked to that's had encounters, even how brief and momentarily it may have been, these creatures have this intellect, this awareness that is frightening of how intelligent they are. And it's so far beyond what our typical canine 
uh, you know, domestic dogs, not, you know, we have uh, Malinois and shepherds and these trained, wonderfully uh, trained dogs that work in the police department and finding people that are amazingly intelligent, but nothing, nothing like this compares of these creatures on what their capability, unscrewing light bulbs, unlocking doors, opening windows, turning knobs, having a thumb that they can grasp and turn a knob and, and opening a false lock on a barn door. These are things that the average canine cannot do and the, in the, the size. So I believe there is a biblical association personally. This is what I believe that there is some foretelling of these creatures that they've been here in my mind, possibly an extremely long time. They've been in isolated areas um, with the internet now that people can communicate all across the planet in a second. They are more exposed, if you will. They're reported on more frequently uh, than years ago that really people didn't have means of communication that fast. So I think they are spoken about. Um, now what I'm talking about, if you want to talk about, are they, are you saying that they are, could be this Nephilim or Nephilim or the Gibor of old? I, I'm saying yes. Do I know that a hundred percent? I'm going to say no, but in order for me to understand to come to grips of their intelligence, that's where Lance classifies them at this point in time. I could be off base, but that's how, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a Christian, and I'm going to say that that's how I understand it. Now, could I be proven wrong tomorrow? Of course, and I would accept that, no problem. I, like anyone else, want to know, but this is how I place it in my mind. So, um I can at least kind of move on and still continue to study, want to observe them, trying to get – my goal is to get extremely clear, unequivocal video of these in action, which has been extremely hard to do because they're not your average canine type of creature. Uh, it's just they're not. And that's about, I know it seems very surreal and very fictional what I just said, but trust me, I'm, I'm aware of what I just said, and it's blind-blowing to me. You know, my whole life has been one stepping stone of weirdness to the next. Um, <laughs> you know, and I'm sitting here hosting a Bigfoot podcast, you know, talking to people that have experienced the same thing I have. And, uh, you know... Several years ago, if you asked me about Dogman, I had told you flat out, nah, people are lying. They don't exist. Now, I've heard so many stories. I've heard stories from people that I know. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, <laughs> I, know. I, I can I, tell I, you I don't that know. Like, I, I, we saw him at a distance. We saw him at a distance. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you, like me, when you when you have a guest, you want to kind of get a backdrop. You know, is this person grew up in the city? Where did you, how did you grow up? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, growing up hunting and fishing all my life, you, as many, many people do, you get this concept of, you know, how things should behave, uh, whether it's a bear, a coyote, a wolf, or whatever. Right. So Wally took me to this area in western Oklahoma and I saw at a distance with my own eyes, I could tell at a distance, looking through a scope, that these were not normal. They were huge in size. There was four of them. They, one was sitting down that was looking at us. Three were milling around. I could tell based on the foreground and background, they were much, much larger than a coyote. Um, we were about 250 yards out. Uh, I wanted to observe. Uh, it's in an area that Wiley's very familiar with, not too far from where he had his encounter in 2003. I was I was kind of shaking because where we're at, you you you're kind of vulnerable where you're at. You're there's nothing between you and them. So 
it's and I've talked to some people that I know personally uh, around this area where I'm at right now that's had encounters and they have no knowledge of any show. They don't know a dog man from um, anything else. They don't follow Bigfoot. They're not researchers. They're just an average dad or mom and they go about their way, go to work and they come home. And I've had a couple people through the grapevine said, Lance, I hear I need to talk to you, but I don't know why. And I'll say, well, why, what do you mean? They go, maybe it's because I saw this and they've took, and the description is quite clear. They saw this dog man creature based on the size where they saw it. And it's really as a crow flies from where I'm at only about seven to eight miles. That's that's not too far from where I live too, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, I ran across. I'm on Facebook. I'm a member of a local group for artists, and one day I was on there, and this guy had posted a picture that he drew of two dogmen chasing a deer. Oh, and I just went on a whim and I sent, sent him a PM and I was like, Hey, tell me about your drawing. You know, how, why'd you draw that? And he told me that it was a sighting that happened in Tulsa. And I'm just like, okay, look, man, <laughs> I yeah. live here. There's no, uh, no, no, no. What do you, what are you talking about? And I was like, I thought, honestly at the time that he had heard the story on a podcast because I had heard rumors of somebody having a guest telling a story of a dog man in Tulsa that they had seen. Mm -hmm. And I said, what, what podcast did you hear that on? He said, I didn't hear it on a podcast. I said, it was it somebody, you know, he said it was me. So I asked him about it and he said that he was hunting, um, He's Native American. The area he was hunting at is technically Tulsa, but, I mean, it's not anywhere near the city. I mean, you know, it's out in the boonies, out in the woods. Okay. And uh, he claims that he was out there deer hunting, and he saw these two werewolf-looking creatures, as he described them, uh, come running out of nowhere through the woods. He's watching them from several, several yards. Like, I don't remember what he said, 30 to 50 yards, I think. And they just ran up and snatched up this buck like it wasn't anything and took off back into the dense woods. And it's shook him ever since. And he decided to start trying to draw images of what he had seen and make artwork out of it. And he was posting it in the group and it was just a fluke deal. And wow. You know, after that, I tried talking to him a couple more times and he wouldn't talk to me anymore. That was it. That was the end of the conversation. Um, Well, there's, there's a, I was fascinated. You just said that because I did interview a gentleman that worked at a hospital that saw one just off the Creek, just on the East side of Tulsa. Wow. Literally right off the Creek Turnpike. And then I spoke to a gentleman who had been on a podcast show, and he got in touch with me, and he said, Lance, uh, I want to take you to my house and show you where I saw one. He literally is in Tulsa. He's in a neighborhood off a street that becomes very uh, – it's one of those old neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. There's like – two to 300 homes that was probably built in the early seventies, but it's on the outskirts of uh, one of the major streets uh, going east and west. And it was in his backyard eating some stale dog food. There was three of them. Um, And then I talked to another gentleman just outside of still in Tulsa County on the same street. If you continue further east about another few miles uh, there's a lot of wild mustangs out there that are uh, on a lot of that property. A lot of beautiful wild mustangs that are on uh, quite a few acreage out there. That is, uh, they're quite pretty to see. 
but he was driving by. He is a dog handler, retired dog handler from California, and he trained dogs for a living for the police departments and finding missing persons. And so he just uh, had some family. He wanted to come to Oklahoma, to Tulsa, and he retired there, and he lived off this street. And he liked going by to see the Mustangs. And one day, in the midday, he was out there driving slow, watching the Mustangs, and he said, oh, they're running. That looks really pretty. And he saw another group of Mustangs running, and he stopped because they were being chased by something behind them that was canine that he said was about as big as one of the horses wow. chasing it from behind. And he chased him over this hill. And so he lost sight of the horses and this creature, he called it like a, a werewolf type creature. It was gathering itself up as a dog gets ready to attack. He says, you can tell because it starts gathering up this energy to get ready to leap out. And that's when he lost sight of it. He, um, and, uh, you know, this is a canine handler that was describing, he said, I could tell this wasn't a horse. This wasn't an average dog. It was too big. It looked like something I had never seen, Lance. But that was in Tulsa County as well. Wow. Well, where can people find your podcast? Oh, okay. Well, they can go to uh, www.monster911.com uh, on the website. As far as the podcast on YouTube, just type in Monster911. Awesome. Uh, is there a certain night that you put them out or day? or? Um, it, I, I usually been putting uh, – right now we're running a special series. Uh, I think we're in week – we're ending week two. I've been putting out a show every night the First week was the, the war with Dogman. The second week was the Kansas Bigfoot, uh, and I have one, two, three, three more weeks of a show every night. Uh, we've got one coming up: uh, a, a guy in a ghillie suit, no way. Um, and there's uh, two more that I'm putting out a show. So it's like a series for the next three weeks. On average, I usually put out a show, one or two shows a week. Wow, busy guy. And then right now, a lot of the shows that I'm in the field with, uh, I'm doing things that I've never done before because I'm by myself into the field. And so on weekends, I'm usually in the field filming at night by myself at the sighting locations. Wow. And so um, those probably won't come out till later in the year. All right. Uh, Monster 911. Lance, thank you so much for coming on, man. I oh, thank you, uh, my mind thank is you just so much. Blown right now, I, I'm I can't get my mind off the future conversations that you and I are going to have. Uh, you, I, I, you know what? I am so glad to finally be able to. Uh, you know, it's kind of like family because I've known about you. I love your show. My brothers and I are. We, we love your show. Listening, oh, thanks, we're big man. fans. Thanks. And uh, so I'm so thrilled to be talking with you finally. That's awesome. And until next time, see you then. Be sure to subscribe, follow, like, and leave a comment if you enjoyed the show. And as always, thanks for listening. Thanks.